Good morning, and thank you for joining us on what is Till Hill's very first in a series of webinars. Firstly, my introduction. I'm Tim Liddon, Till Hill's Forestry Director, and it's my pleasure to be your host today. Sadly, we cannot meet face to face, and many of the spring and summer shows where you would have had a good opportunity to meet many of my team are unlikely to happen this year. So with a crash course in Zo using Zoom, Microsoft Teams and Skype under our belts, we've come up with the first of what we hope will be a series of webinars to ensure that we can still reach across Scotland and let you know a bit more about our topic today, farm woodland creation. The rural landscape is changing. Brexit, common agricultural policy, Scottish Government land use initiatives and now coronavirus. There is also a significant greater focus on carbon and climate mitigation as well as for us all to consider. Which of these are threats and which are opportunities is difficult to fathom at times and one size does not fit all. One positive that we can take away from coronavirus at least is that our mileage has dropped together with a subsequent fall in fuel prices and I've heard red diesel about 18 pence a litre. Through everything though, forestry and woodland remain a steady and loyal partnership option when it comes to providing farmers and landowners with some additional income streams. I hope this webinar will give you a glimpse of what woodland can provide and help you make more informed decisions going forward in order to help secure greater financial security for both you, your family, and your future generations. We have two presenters today who will give you a brief insight into some of the benefits and how we, Till Hill, can help you assess the opportunity on your farm, help you find funding and your project, and then how we can manage your woodland to ensure you get the very best return from your investment. We will have some time for questions and answers at the end, but do feel free to fire questions in on the Q&A panel on screen. And we will endeavor to answer them as best we can once we've heard from the presenters. Our first speaker is Callum Murray, our business development manager in Scotland. He has enjoyed over 25 years in forestry. Callum will give you an insight into why he and many of the clients he has worked with think woodlands fit well in farm business plans and guide you through what help there is to turn a farm woodland into a reality. So, over to Callum. Yes, yeah, so I'm Callum Murray. I'm uh, based in the north of Scotland. Um, in my role as um, business development manager for Channel Hill, um, you'll find me out about so sort of anywhere in Austin, Forest and Clyde. You'll not be surprised to know that I, I think most farms need, need trees from a few to provide somewhere for beasts to shelter um, through to a potentially sizable um, woodland that can really offer some making and diversity to the farm enterprise. I suspect most of you um, today are farmers and farmers what you brought up on. Trees might just have been a bit of a waste of space in some cases and they've probably not been um, the priority for you when there's so many other jobs to get on the farm. My role is to change that thought, to help you see the opportunities and potential that Woodlands can bring, uh, enabling you to maximise your income from any given bit of land on your farm, um, whilst making the most of the additional non-timber benefits trees can offer. Of course, that should also increase your farm's overall value and hopefully add to your enjoyment of the farm. At the very least though, it's, it's always beneficial to look at all of the options available to you and, and be assured that uh, if I think the woodland is not the best option for the land, I, I'll say that to you too. So what do trees offer? Well, money is kind of, I suppose, key to a lot of things and you would like to hear that trees are certainly offer money. Um, so income, you know, through having an extra surface potentially at plant, after planting from grant support or um, otherwise from income from the timber later on. And as we said, land value, a well-established crop with good access 
um, can significantly increase the value of your land. Forests and woodlands always sell well on the open market. If we put income aside for a moment, um, you might be looking for um, on the farm shelter on a windy, cold, or I was going to say very rare hot day, but we've had a good run on them lately. Um, we all appreciate some shelter and, and pass any field with trees to the edge, you'll often find the, the bees using that as well. The studies have shown that by offering shelter from the worst of the wind, you can save a couple of percent on feed costs year after year. Animals gaining that little extra warmth means that they save energy and that same energy of course can be converted into growth. And in the areas where early lambing takes place, that additional shelter can also be a, a real bonus for young lambs and can lead to better survival rates because they, they gain that bit of extra protection. Another possibility is keeping beasts out that little bit longer. That might also reduce the, the risk of disease when they're confined and, and housed hard. So you might have a bit less medication costs. And indeed, actually, if you look at some trees, such as willow, they're, they're not to be used by cattle to self-medicate. Willow is a source of salicylic acid, which is the base of aspirin. So you can actually almost plant your own additional crop. If we look at the windbreak created by the trees, it can also help you retain, retain soil. Those of us in the northeast are fairly used to seeing a, a dry, windy spell just after spring sowing, when not only the soil can be blown off fields, but potentially seed to be lifted too. And it's been estimated by the likes of DEFRA in England, and we can relate that to Scotland, that the cost of lost agriculture input due to soil erosion was actually nearly as much as for water erosion. And we kind of understand water erosion, but maybe not soil erosion so much. So, well, I've mentioned um, water and, and tree planting can, of course, soak up those heavy rainfalls by intercepting, slowing down that water when it's still on the hill before it gushes across fields, washing everything away. So trees can help you hang on to your topsoil, which is probably the most viable thing in any farm. And just to give you a real illustration, I was at a farm recently where flash flooding from a barn had overtopped the road. Um, that, it, that the bird otherwise usually went under, it washed that road away and you know there was a feral cost to that and yes a bit of strategic tree planting would most likely have helped slow that water down and actually save some money beyond that. Of course we're all going to recognise that there's timber value in, in trees and whether that's just from, from firewood for your own log burner or indeed to sell on and you know firewood can be a a reasonable sideline business on any farm, you've probably got half the equipment already in tractor and loader and you can even get grants to help with other machines to help make processing more efficient. And there's a, there's a pound or two to be made in, in, in that. Alternatively, another product, um, biomass or wood chip, um, if you have a grain dry floor, a chicken shed or you know, even a, a big farmhouse, and as, as I'm sure many do with a, a luxury power spool, a part, spot or pool, I killed that joke, um, you could be thinking about installing a, a biomass heating system. So why not be producing um, your own fuel wood? Um, one of the most expensive costs for biomass is, is often transport. And if it's coming from um, your farm, that can cut, cut costs and, and give you an advantage. If we look at the, the bigger logs, um, it's probably worth considering that there's a you know, it's always a good demand for, for timber and currently Britain is still importing the vast majority of its timber um, so there's much more potential out there and most areas have got reasonable access to you know, big sawmills which will, will pay good prices for, for quality timber. I guess you're going to ask how long might it be before you see some money back? Well on reasonable ground you could potentially see thinning from a conifer crop in, in 18, 20 years, maybe a little less. Um, or from clear fell uh, in sort of 35 to 40. Um, and all of that you know, should have very good returns. Other alternatives to, to in, another alternative source of income or, or, or certainly just enjoyment could come from other woodland for, for game birds. Um, young woodland can provide um, shelter in the long grass that tends to surround the trees and, and that older woodland can provide uh, a roost. 
And with a bit of specialist design, you can have a woodland that can actually enhance the drive, you know, potentially forcing the bars to lift, making it a bit more challenging for guns. Now that's not you know, just great sporting, uh, but of course people will pay for the opportunity to, to shoot aim. So there's another, another potential source of income there. And, and finally, I think the diversity of, of having a woodland on a farm will also um, undoubtedly bring more wildlife. Um, you know, both broad, broadleaf and conifer woodlands provide different opportunities. Um, and even something like a commercial sitka woodland offers far more habitat than, than actually a lot of conservation conservationists um, would like to admit. And you know, I think all of us that, that, that work on the land enjoy having that wildlife around us as, as we work. So what would you what would you grow? Um, well that depends very much on the soil and your priorities and to a lesser extent um, your thoughts on how the climate might change. Are you going for income, the environment, a bit of both? Um, and of course we need to think long term, um, 40 years for spruce, still over 100 years for oak, so we need to get it right. Trees of course grow at different rates and we measure that in forestry's yield class and that's essentially an average measure of cubic metres of timber accumulated per hectare per year and the table you're seeing is there really to, to give you some comparisons of how different trees will grow. So for best and quickest return from a commercial group in Scotland, we're probably going to point in the direction of, of, of spruce. It grows fast with high demand for all its products from, from trunk to tip. On some drier, heather hill ground, something like you know, traditional Scots pine might be more suitable. Um, we might also look at things like Douglas fir, Westwood cedar, or something like even hemlock. These are useful secondary conifer species. Um, where we're looking to make sure there's some diversity and resilience in the woodland design, uh, you know, a, a bit of variety, uh, just to give you that wee bit of bang. And of course, the grant system actually encourages to, to do that, to think about those, those things as well. Occasionally, we'll come across a, a, a rich, fertile site where oak or sycamore could do well on a commercial basis. Um, it does, those, those species do need long-term looking after them though, to produce uh, the quality that um, you need to really get the premium prices that you're going to want. <laughs> of course, you might want to look at the woodland for the, just, just for the environment um, with, with that kind of focus. And you know, we've, we've mentioned we, we could also look to, to mixtures of birch, oak, cherry, aspen, willow, there's a variety of other native trees that we could, we could use there to kind of give you that, that, that really nice woodland that, that will benefit, I say, the environment. What I would say though is, is do take professional advice um, to get what's right for you and your farm, because as we said, that choice is going to be there for a long time, so we need to get it right at the outset. And there is a real enthusiasm for planting woods. Um, well, of course, you know, at the moment we're right, focusing on the, the pandemic, um, but climate change is not going away and there's, there's strong government support out there for, for tree planting and expanding woodlands. That support mostly comes through the Scottish Environment, Scottish Forestry Grant Scheme, um, but there's other routes um, to grants and that could potentially be through the Agri-Environment grant, grant Scheme or um, in some cases through the Crofting Agricultural Grant Scheme. I'll, I'll focus a wee bit today though on, on the, the forestry grant scheme and uh, woodland creation. Um, but yeah, it's worth remembering that there's other options available to help you improve existing woodlands if you've got them as well. So grants are available from just over a thousand pounds a hectare to over six thousand pounds a hectare depending on the, the circumstances um, and, and the type of trees you want to plant. The, 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 there's a two different levels, you can get basic amount of grant, but that can be enhanced to encourage particular types of woodland in, in key areas, and actually further enhanced by things like um, Central Scotland and Green Network target area scheme, where planting in the top priority there, area there can add up to now two and a half thousand pounds of income per hectare. So you can actually look at over eight and a half thousand pounds a hectare for, for planting. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the grants are, are split into initial payments and maintenance payments. Around 60% of the grant being 
paid at uh, initial planting, and the remainder, um, the maintenance payments, uh, are split over the next five years, and, and they'll come through your through your SAF form. Um, any rural creation scheme also be eligible for a range of capital grant supports payable as the first trees are planted, uh, and they can help with things like new fences, um, grouse marking, or enabling public access, and um, some of the things that are not just really getting trees in the ground. But again, with lots of grant scheme options, you're going to want to maximise those to your best advantage. And we, we've got literally you know, experience of hundreds of applications. And that's where something like Tailhill can help you get as much support out of the grant system um, to make sure so you're maximising that grant and make the most out of the, you know, the rural creation opportunity. I'll maybe mention one final scheme, um, and that's uh, the Sheep and Tree scheme. Um, something a little bit different. It's, it can provide additional support for getting roads and tracks onto your land uh, in conjunction with that, that new rule of creation. Um, the infrastructure grant that the kind of supports normally comes with felling, but um, in terms of a farm at a plant stage, it, it can help you get better access to more of your farm, enabling you to run the rest of that business, hopefully that wee bit more easily for the, for the rest of the, you know, the time that those trees are growing. So how much does it does it cost? Um, I, and that's that's a, a quite an individual thing. Um, we'd have to consider things like the, the, the cost of getting the grant application approved. Uh, in some cases, you know, we might need to gather quite a bit of data. Um, you know, things like the environment and soils and on, on a variety of other kind of factors. Uh, but with our experience and discussion with the, the regulators in Scottish Forestry, we can hopefully you know help you keep those costs to a minimum. What type of woodland you know, you, you're planting? Of course, different trees, different treatments cost different amounts, and, and you know, it'll be what's right for your situation. Um, as I said, that initial site type, what kind and extent of preparation does the site need, need to give the trees the best start? We're also going to need to consider the, the scale of the project and the maintenance of the crop will like, likely need in the first few years. But for all those elements, some, we've got access to a, a wide range of quality, suppl quality suppliers and contractors, so you know, we can help you get the, the, not only the best quality scheme, but make sure that prices are competitive too. Oh, sorry, let's move on there. Um, so I suppose it's worth, worth summarising saying that the grants can pay for all of the planting and establishment. And you know, if the project scale is, is big enough, you could actually have a good health, healthy surplus, which you could then potentially invest in other, other areas of the farm. Going beyond that, there's also um, things like woodland carbon funding, which could be a, a top up for um, schemes that might otherwise financially be more marginal. Um, so other things we can help you have a look at. And finally worth mentioning, you can claim um, your basic farm payment on, on planted land. So that will give you a bit of interim income while the trees grow to produce that first timber. So that's actually just a very quick and, and brief run through of some of the reasons you might think about exploring the world option, option and how you might fund it. Of course, you're going to want to take specific advice for your situation. And it's worth saying it costs you nothing to get us out for that initial advice. So, you know, it'd be great if you give me a call. I'd love to come out and see you when we can um, and, and make sure that we give you, you know, the best advice for, for your particular farm. Thanks for that now. I'm going to hand you back to Tim, who I guess is going to have one or two questions from you and from me. Thank you, Callum. Um, we do have one or two questions. Um, the first one for you is, where does SRC and SRF play its part? I'm assuming that that's uh, short rotation coppice and short rotation forestry. Yeah, there, there are certainly options on, on, on better ground. We talked about that biomass um, option. Um, so using short rotation uh, copy something like willow um, can certainly give you quite a lot of volume quite quickly. Um, 
uh, and that could be something that we, we can certainly consider for you on, on the farm. Um, and it'll depend a bit on what markets you might have, have around about, or, or as I say, what, what um, other uses you might have for it yourself. Okay, and, uh, and another question that's come in, uh, do you think there is a risk of losing these grants post-Brexit? There's a million dollar question for you. <laughs> I don't. I really don't think so. I, we mentioned the we mentioned the carbon uh, issue and, and carbon situation, and, and you've heard all of the um, the rhetoric in, in, in the, you know, the relatively recent government uh, elections. Everybody wanted more tree plants, and there's they've got to you know, continue to encourage that. And the best way to encourage that is, is through grants. Um, and all the noises that we're hearing is that there are going to be. Um, changes to the grant system, but whatever they are, it's, it, it's going to encourage environmental benefit, carbon sequestration, and, and, and woodland forestry kind of delivers both of those in, in, uh, in, a, in a big way. Okay, I think one of the, uh, the, the good things in Scotland is the political support behind uh, forestry and woodland creation, uh, mainly linked to the economy, but equally well to climate change. Uh, so, uh, Focus Ewing is, is very supportive of that. Absolutely. Um, we have, uh, where's the next one? Um, we have one question about an overview, uh, which grants are available. Uh, we will make sure that there is a link um, to where the Scottish forestry grants are coming from. So now to our second speaker, who is Eddie Addis, Till Hill's Regional Manager for South Scotland. Uh, Eddie and his team manage many hectares of woodlands and forests uh, for a, a broad range of clients. Eddie will take us uh, through some examples of farm woodland projects and how they can work across a diverse range of circumstances. Common to all is how Till Hill has planned gained approval, secured grant aid, and then delivered on the quality project. So, over to you, Eddie. Right, uh, thanks to Tim for the, for the introduction and Callum for the overview. As Tim said, I'm Eddie Addis. I'm the, the regional manager for South Scotland for forestry. Across the South Scotland region, we manage a, a wide range of woodland types from extensive commercial complexes to small native and farm woodlands. Um, and over recent times, we've seen a significant rise in the, the interest and demand and also the delivery of woodland creation projects across the region and the wider country as well. Callum's touched on already, but it's largely been driven by the, the grants that are available under the Forestry Grant Scheme, um, but also by the, the strong political support from the Scottish Government and their um, ambitious targets to see woodland creation expanded and woodland cover expanded across Scotland. The, the recent interest in woodland creation has seen a, a rapid rise in, in, the, in, the, in the amount of woodland creation that is going across, across the countryside, but it's not, it's not necessarily a new thing. It's something that we as a company have been doing for decades now. Um, we've got a lot of experience in planning delivery um, of, these, of these projects and also the, the follow-up maintenance to ensure that whatever's planted is managed to the best of its potential um, and delivers the, the best value to the asset from the asset at the end of the day. So what I want to do today is just talk you through a, a couple of examples um, of woodland creation projects that we've been involved in on farms across South Scotland. And this is just really a highlight of, of two of many that we, we've delivered. The first one, first example is probably relatively large in terms of what we would think of as a, as a farm woodland. Um, it was an area of land which was geographically remote to the rest of the, the farm unit. Relatively rough grazing um, compared to the rest of the land on the, on the farm. The, the fences round about it were starting to become fairly porous and needed a lot of attention. And access to the, to the farm itself was from a, from a main trunk road. So getting stock on and off the piece of land was time and labour intensive because a lot of it was done by stock trailers. The farmer in question knew of Tell Hill because we managed the woodland next door and we had a good working relationship through that, trying to keep the, the fences maintained over time. Um, he came to us 
looking for a bit of information and some ideas of what you could do with the land from a forestry perspective. We initially tried to ascertain his objectives from it. Was it commercial? Was there other objectives to it? Um, went out, had a meeting with him on the ground, walked the site and looked at its potential for forestry to try and understand if there were any severe limitations or restrictions that would have hindered a woodland creation project on here. From the initial visit, we would then we would then went away and worked up a concept design and indicative cash flow attached to that, which was presented to the, the farmer. And despite some minor tweaks um, here and there to the design just to improve what it what it was delivering from his perspective, he was largely satisfied with what we presented and gave us the go-ahead to proceed working up into a formal project. From there, we went into a, a more detailed set of site surveys. And this is really to understand the, the site a bit better, what species are suitable to it, um, if there is any major issues or constraints that would affect the design over all the productive area or even be detrimental to the scheme itself. We look at soils, ecology, breeding birds, um, look at vegetation in detail, landscape and a, a range of other factors. Having worked through that process, we came up with a, a more formal draft design, which was used to inform a forestry grant scheme application that was put forward to Scottish Forestry, which then goes out to a range of stakeholders and consultees for comment um, also goes out on the public register which is where the, the public can also have their say if they've got any issues or concerns around the, the proposal. From there Scottish Forestry deemed the, the scheme competent, um, it was approved and a contract was issued and the contract not only gives permission to actually proceed with the planting work, but as Callum touched on earlier, it also gives access to the grant funding, which in this case was a capital grant payment in year one, which goes largely towards the, the initial cost of establishing the woodland itself. Five years of maintenance payments, um, and these are really to ensure that the, the, the woodland is maintained through those early years, the sort of key critical years to try and get the trees established and ensure things do grow properly. And then basic payments, they can be, if the land is eligible, you can continue to claim the basic payments on the land itself under the contract for the contract duration, which is 20 years with a standard FGS contract. Once we had the, the contract in hand, the landowner was keen to proceed. Um, so the site was prepared and planted in winter and spring 2015. Initially, we started with getting on site, getting the ground preparation done and any fencing done. So the ground preparation in this case was done by a continuous mounder, which produces mounds of soil that give a raised weed-free planting position to plant the trees on. And this not only helps suppress the vegetation around them, it gives a, a slightly warmer microclimate in the soil and also helps the trees get established quickly and keeps them out of the out of the nasty elements beside them. Fencing here, there was some work to be done to the, the stock fencing where there would still be pressure on it externally. So that was that was undertaken to make sure that we could keep the, the trees and any adjacent livestock separate. Internally we erected a series of enclosures with deer fencing, which protects the some of the softer conifers on site and also the some of the areas of native broadleaves that were planted. The reason for deer fencing is there's a high roe deer population locally um, and there's also rabbits and hares present as well and it keeps all of those potential pests out of the, the, the areas in question, stops them damaging the young trees. They can do quite a lot of damage by taking the leader off the tree which not only slows down the, the establishment which can increase maintenance in terms of weeding requirements, but it also ensures that the, the final crop quality is maximised because the, losing the leader at the early stages can affect what's there at the end of the rotation. And as we know with any crop, you need to maximise the value in that crop. The key to ensuring that the woodland is established well is, is maintenance. Um, you've got to get the planting right initially, but then the follow-up maintenance from there on is, is very important. Here, there was a, a process of maintenance 
programme of maintenance, probably through years one to three was the key period, which is a, a, it's mainly weeding and beating up, which weeding, as it sounds, is vegetation control to, to keep any vegetation competition back from the trees, stop them getting smothered, and also just ensure that the, they aren't getting out-competed for the, the resources. Beating up is a process of going through the crop once a year and replacing any failed trees. This is at standard, it's completely normal. We expect to lose up to 10% conifers in year one and potentially up to 15% broadleaves, depending on the site conditions and also the, the weather that's experienced throughout the first growing season and any other external pressures that the trees might come under. This maintenance just ensures that the trees do get established, maximises the final crop quality, but it also ensures that the scheme is planted and maintained to the standards set out in the grant contract. And that's quite important as well because Scottish forestry can come back at any time and inspect the crop. Generally, between years three and five, they'll come back, they'll do an inspection of what's there and just make sure that it does meet the grant specification. If it doesn't, they can enforce remedial works to bring it up to standard or worst case scenario, if it is very bad, they can actually make you, you know, they can look into doing grant reclaims, which I don't think anyone would want. So thinking about some of the, the challenges that we encountered during the delivery of this project, a lot of them are found in the, the, the early stages. So when you do, if you do detailed site surveys, if you do your homework, basically you, you, you highlight a lot of the issues and challenges and, and deal with them before it comes to the actual implementation on the ground. In this case, archeology span was quite an important one. Through some of the initial survey work, we identified quite a lot of archeological features on site. Most of them were fairly easy to incorporate into the designed open ground of the scheme. They could be buffered and they didn't affect the productive area. There was quite extensive rig and furrow across the site, but the regional archaeologist was initially keen to protect. That would have had a, a, a serious impact on the, the plantable area and the viability of the overall project. Through discussion with the, the archaeologists in Scottish Forestry, we managed to negotiate a position where we would protect the best example of rig and furrow on the site. That was then incorporated into the, the designed open ground on the scheme and we were then allowed to, to plant the extra areas of rig and furrow as per the proposal. Black grouse, through the consultation process, the, the issue that of the potential of black grouse being present locally was raised. Um, it does sit within a, a core black grouse area. So the, the stakeholders had asked that the fences be marked with bird strike fencing, which as it sounds is to prevent any grouse that are present from striking the deer fences. Again, we had discussions with Scottish Forestry and managed to secure the, the additional funding to have the fences marked. So there was no additional cost to the, to the landowner in this case and the fences were marked. The third one and one I hadn't come across before was the presence, presence of Northern Brown Argus butterflies. They are associated with a, a specific plant called rock rose and that's the habitat they like. We were made aware of the, the, the plant was, a bit, uh, was present locally and also there were populations of the northern brown argus butterfly nearby. That meant we had to go back over the site, relook at the vegetation and identify any significant areas of rock rose and we buffered these and again incorporated them into designed open ground in the scheme. You're allowed up to 10% grant funded open ground in your scheme. So that was the main issues we faced. We managed to work through them um, and also managed to not lose any significant productive area whilst protecting the, the, the issues that have been raised. Callum's mentioned a bit about what, what value woodlands can provide to farm businesses. This proposal, or this, this project itself, the initial income from the, the grant funding, there's obviously value in that, but that largely goes to offset the costs or cover the cost of the woodland creation itself. Callum mentioned briefly carbon too, which is a, essentially a top up to the grants. Um, it's, carbon funding has been about for a while. It's still relatively in its infancy from a forestry point of view, and there's a lot of, lot of work going on around about that just now. The thing with carbon is it's, it, it's a payment to cover the, the, essentially the carbon that's sequestered by the crop over the, the, the length of its rotation. 
So because of that, some of the, the carbon contracts can be quite long and also can be quite prescriptive. So it's something that should be considered carefully before anyone enters into an agreement on it. Thinning. Thinning is an operation that's carried out mid-rotation in a commercial crop. And it's really a silvicultural operation that is it's done to try and maximise the final value of that crop at the end of the rotation. But given the, the recent demand for the biomass and the strong prices that are being paid for small roundwoods or chipwood and pulpwood, thinnings are actually returning a healthy income to woodland owners now. Um, so it's something that is starting to be carried out more and more because it is giving some financial benefits partway through the, the, the life cycle. Clear felling, end of rotation, harvest, that's the sort of the big lump of income you will get from that crop. And that's why you need to make sure that what you are growing is the, the best it can be, because that's when you do you do see significant variance in income from the, the, the crop quality of what's done at the start of the rotation. And also with a woodland of this scale and the fact it's independent to the, the farm unit, it's got its own good access for future timber harvesting. There is always the, the potential here to consider selling it off as a, as a standalone woodland, which allows the, the farm business to realise the capital from that at any point during the rotation. And the market for woodlands at the minute is very strong, so that's always a, always a good, good one to have in the bank. Moving on to the, the second example, which is probably what people would see and think of as a more traditional farm woodland, smaller, more geometric blocks. This, again, was a, an area of approximately 10 hectares, which was brought to us by a, a farmer um, who identified that it was offering very little to the farm business already. It was very poor grazing on the edge of his unit. And we'd already done some work with him in clearing a, a small windblown shelter belt back in 2018 which at the time, until he spoke to us, thought it was more of a liability than an asset to the farm. And even though it was windblown and the access was tricky, the return he got from it was attractive. Um, he was impressed by the return he got, and he was also impressed by the fact that it was harvested and extracted with minimal damage to the, the surrounding farmland. The restock has also done very well, and the trees are essentially established and are getting away above the weeds. So he's been, he's been heartened by that, and actually sees woodland as a, as a potential value to the farm and not something that should be shied away from. He identified this area, came to us, we went through a very similar process as we did with the, the previous example. Um, we worked up a, a proposal for him, a concept design and a cash flow, which he was happy with. We then took that forward to Scottish Forestry as a formal forestry grant scheme application to secure permission to do the planting and the funding. This time it was a very quick turnaround from getting the go-ahead to getting the contract, it took us approximately two months, and that was largely down to good relationships and good preparation with the, the regulators involved. We got the, the, the contract for this particular proposal through from Scottish Forestry in February this year, which allowed us to, to very quickly move on to delivery. Um, we undertook similar operations to the larger example we've seen previously. So continuous mounding was undertaken, um, again, giving a good planting position. And this time the, the blocks were stock fenced to keep the stock out of them, but there was no deer fencing or rabbit or hare fencing put on because the populations are relatively low and the broad leaves were planted in 1.2 meter um, tree shelters to protect them. From then we, we went on to the planting um, and there was a very, quick turnaround from initial concept to delivery, it was just over four months. Maintenance, look at a similar programme as we have with the, the previous scheme. We will go in, undertake weeding and beating up to ensure the trees are established and that they're up to the, the correct standards set out in the, the grant contract. Challenges on this one, they were smaller because it's a smaller scheme. Um, the the key ones we had here were landscape, so they are geometric blocks, they do sit on a hill ridge, they're visible close up from a public road that passes by, but they're also visible from longer distances as well because it's an open landscape. We had to do a bit of work to ensure that there, there was no significant straight edges, so that was a case of scalloping the edges using broad leaves and open ground and some other diverse conifers as well. Archaeology again is quite a common one in 
certainly in the Scottish borders, we find a lot of archaeology. Um, most of it we can work around. Here again, we, we managed to tweak the design slightly to buffer the archaeology, move one of the blocks about 20 metres, which allowed the archaeology to, to be protected, um, but also ensured that we maintained the productive area of the blocks and the, the other benefits that they will offer. Other issues here, breeding birds, protected species, vegetation, because it was a smaller scheme, we didn't have to do quite as formal a survey process before we got the permission. But as part of the, the permission, it was agreed that we would do a walkover with one of our in-house team, uh, one of our ecologists, who would assess the site for presence of breeding birds, any sensitive vegetation, or any other protected species, just pre-operational. Pre Fortunately, the, the survey didn't turn up anything, so we're allowed to continue with the work. In terms of the, the value this woodland will deliver to the farm, as I mentioned before, you've still got the thinning potential for the income mid-rotation. You've got the clear fell income at the end of the rotation. But here, one of the key drivers was shelter. The, as I said, the woodland sit on an exposed ridge, um, predominantly southwesterly winds, and the land to the northeast of the box is actually better, although still exposed. So the farmer wanted something that would establish quickly and provide good shelter for his other land, improving the quality of the, the grazing to the northeast of these blocks, which commercial conifers tick those boxes. So that's a very brief run through of two projects that we've been involved in out of many across the south of Scotland. Um, what now? If you've got any further interest in woodland creation, I would suggest that you, you get in touch with us. Um, we've got a network of local offices throughout Scotland, throughout the UK. Um, in each of those, we've got an experienced team of managers who are more than happy to come out, visit your farm, visit your, your land, and discuss your objectives, what you want to achieve. Um, looking at woodland creation or even existing woodlands that you've got, you'd like to understand what values in them or what management options there are for them. So please get in touch, arrange someone to come out and see you, um, and we can take it from there. And with that, Thank you for listening, and I'll hand you back to Tim for any questions. Thanks for that, Eddie. Uh, we've got uh, a number of questions for yourself and, and, and Callum. Uh, starting off with yourself, Eddie, uh, how long can you get BPS on planting land? Under FGS, the land, if it's eligible before, will still be eligible for the duration of the contract with a standard FGS contract that's up to, well, it is 20 years for a standard FGS contract. Great. And uh, what is the smallest size of holding that we would look at? Um, the question here comes from somebody that has a 10 hectare croft. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we'd, we initial initially we'd uh, we'd certainly consider any scale. I mean, you just have to consider each one on its merits and what's involved, and also what grant funding is available and the objectives for that. So I think if you if you've got any any questions or queries, even for small scale stuff, please get in touch and we can we can um, try and help you out. Okay. Um... You know, your crystal ball for this one. Uh, do you think the grants will get larger going forward? Um, the question comes from somebody that thinks it's true in Wales that uh, they are substantially higher uh, and for longer terms. Uh, could this come to Scotland? Uh, is it better to wait? Um, very good crystal ball gazing that one. I think with the, the level of woodland creation we're seeing just now, I don't think Personally, I wouldn't see a significant rise in grant um, in the near future because they are already getting good delivery under the, the scheme as it stands just now. As Callum mentioned, there is other there is other top up grants in certain parts of the country for schemes that deliver against certain objectives. So, depending where you are in the country, there is stronger grant funding than just the base funding. Um, and the other things we've mentioned already is likes of carbon as well. That there is potentially slightly different income streams for for woodlands than just a traditional forestry grant scheme. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Callum, when are carbon payments going to be coming on board more, uh, or is it better to wait? 
Carbon Payments Group, we're looking at that on pretty much every project that we, we're putting out now. Um, we think you should be at least um, registering your uh, any new planting scheme so that it has um, the ability to, to claim carbon, whether you choose to take the, the money now or whether you want to speculate and, and see if the price goes up in a, in a few years' time. That's, uh, that's a, a difficult one. But it, it will also depend on your, your cash flow. Um, do you need the money early on? Does it, is it, you know, if it's a, we see it as a bit of a top up sometimes to, to a scheme. Um, that just from the grant funding, they might not pay for all the, the costs and the carbon can help with that and add a little bit more beside. So you might want to take either some or all of that potential income sort of very early on um, and then hold on to it later. And increasingly more companies that are buying the carbon are, are looking, to, um, looking to do that, recognise what it can do for them in terms of their... I suppose to some extent PR side, but also all of the, the, the big companies of the sort of twelve thousand biggest companies in Britain are required to report um, what their impact on, on carbon um, is. And, and and they're looking to increasingly buy up more carbon. So I've probably not given an answer as to whether or not you should actually um, wait for carbon money or, or, or take it now. But you know, it will depend, as I say, a bit on your situation. Um, and your, your scheme um, but it, it's certainly something that you've got to be looking at you've got to be um, signing up for an early stage because you can only um, register your scheme um, so, so the camera becomes available if you do that it's about to move to within the first six months um, after planting so um, definitely keep your options open Great, thanks I would certainly uh, register any scheme um, and I think it's uh, going to be a hot topic over the next uh, 12 months to see what changes. Okay, um, is there a maximum hectare you can claim grants on? Eddie? Not as far as I'm aware, Tim, is the, is the answer to that one. Um, there is a, there's a, a tiered system to the, the grant funding, so once the scheme gets over a certain size, the, the grants do drop um, slightly, but once you get into the sort of economies of scale, that's why that's really structured like that. So I think it's off the top of my head over 300 hectares that the grants take a step down. But once you're up to 300 hectares, it's standard. And I certainly haven't seen any restrictions on the overall size. Okay. Um, Callum, at what stage do, would you start charging for your time? Well, what we'd certainly like to do is we certainly like to just come out and have a look at the, the, the scheme. Um, we'll give you a cash flow, um, an outline design, um, have some discussion with you about that. Um, and if, you, if you're happy to go ahead from there, and we'll, we'll have given you um, an estimate of cost for, for all of the, the, the elements to get that um, through planning, assuming there's no hidden surprises in there. Um, and all of you made right, right the way through to the you know, maintenance costs. So, once we've got that kind of cash flow generally agreed, um, then we start we start building our, our, our costs in. Um, but as I say, getting us out for that, that first visit, um, getting some idea of what it might might cost you or what you might might get off a, off a scheme, that's not going to cost you anything initially. Okay. Um, question here about PT soils. Uh, they seem to be becoming an issue uh, on some of the upland creation sites, not just peat deep peats but shallow peaty soils that are below the 40 to 50 cent centimetre threshold. Uh, Eddie you've probably got most experience on that just now. Um, any comments? Yeah I mean the, the, the peats obviously we're not allowed to, to plant anything over, over 50 centimetres peat because that's classed as deep peat and is excluded from woodland creation. Um, Below 50 centimetres, it's not really becoming a problem for getting permission to establish woodlands on it, but there is more focus on what cultivation techniques you can use on PT soils. Um, and this is again down to the, the sort of carbon discussion and the concerns that certain methods of cultivation on the, the PT soils will release more carbon in the short term than the woodlands will sequester. But as an industry and specifically as a company, we're doing a lot of work on that because we don't believe some of the guidance out there is 100% correct um, and we feel as a, 
as an industry, we should challenge it if we don't feel what's being put out there is correct. So it's still an area that's um, it's a hot topic just now. It will be discussed for some time, but it's not preventing woodland creation. It's just modifying what you can do. Thank you for that. Okay, the, the, the last question that we've, uh, we've got is uh, what about insurance against fire in popular tourist areas and wind throw in exposed areas? Certainly we're having some, uh, our fair share of uh, fire, woodland fires. Um, how do we deal with that? Eddie. Um, well, we can offer woodland insurance. We do have a, a, a woodland insurance package that we can offer to cover woodlands for the, the, the issues that you've mentioned. So from fire um, and damage to the, the young crops, but also wind damage to the, the older crops as well. So that can be included in any, any cash flow or budget. We can give you a, an indicative cost for woodland insurance as well. Another one's just popped up. Um, what other options are available for short-term income apart from thinnings? Callum. I suppose we mentioned a couple of other ones there. The way that you, you might use your wood, so um, you know, potentially can be uh, used for um, used for, for, for grouse. Um, oh, sorry, for, for, for pheasant shooting, for other bird, bird shooting, might be an option there. Um, and because probably you're going to want to close the woodland and to keep other livestock out of it, it might not be something that you can get um, shelter out of it early on until the trees are up and away and established. Um, but I suppose it'll have to bear in mind that, as we said earlier, you'll have your um, basic payment um, coming in, so that will give you some, some early income um, from, the, from the tree crop. Possibility, and um, you could um, plant. Um, a bit of a tighter spacing um, and potentially if you manage them well enough take a few trees out as Christmas trees um, you've still got to achieve a kind of a basic level at year, at year five but beyond that um, something like some Norway spruce or some flowers mixed in amongst the crop and um, they're a bit of work but um, as I say that, that might be another option for, uh, for some return um, a bit earlier. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, some good searching questions there. Uh, I hope that Callum and Eddie have given you a glimpse of how Till Hill can help you get a better understanding of how we design and plan and execute farm woodland creation. Over the years, Till Hill has uh, planted round about a billion trees uh, and worked through many different grant schemes. Uh, we do this for our living and we know what we do and we want to you to benefit from, from our experience. So David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg are two very different generations pushing for tree planting to save our planet and that's a thought to go home with. We have another webinar for England next month so watch out for info and on our social media and website for that and thanks for listening and for your questions. So have safe travels even if it's just going to the kitchen to get a cup of coffee. Thank you very much.